hostility by the Gene McCarthy and McGovern forces by then at the Democratic Convention. Humphrey was dying inside. He wanted to tell people what he really believed about Vietnam. Even before the convention, Johnson sent very direct messages to Humphrey. If you break with my war policy, I will make sure that that convention is unpleasant for you. Johnson was intensely interested in what was happening there. I think he was most interested in ensuring that his plank on Vietnam remained in the party platform. Humphrey's going to favor stopping the bombing. Uh, that's what he's going to put in the platform. And when he does, I think he'll get probably a majority. I'd hope he wouldn't. I'd just hope that they'd defeat. But he'll get the Kennedys and McGoverns and Humphrey, and I guess all three of them together with nobody there representing us except John. And none of them speaking up on him. Uh, God knows what happened. Fundamentally, Johnson loved power. And he had already had several months being the retiring president, and he didn't like it one bit. He realized that Humphrey really hadn't sold. Johnson knew the party leaders in the various states. He knew the chairman of the caucuses. And the convention had been set around his birthday. So it was an opportunity for him to fly into Chicago, accept birthday wishes, and oh, by the way, as his present, take the nomination. He was even planning the logistics what time Mrs. Johnson would come in and how they would get to the convention hall. Tentatively, we hope to come in and we want to know where to go. And we go to the closest place where we have the safest place to the amphitheater. I guess we go to the Hilton. Does that have a helicopter roof landing? It just couldn't be done. The town would have exploded even more than it did with Humphrey. We heard a ruckus down, you know, below us. We were in the front window. We went over there and we saw the cops coming up Balboa and then take that turn into Grant Park and go in there and wail the daylights out of those demonstrators and rioters or whatever you want, protesters, for about 10 or 15 minutes. And that was the event, I think, that destroyed the Democratic Party that year. As Hunter Thompson said, uh, Richard Nixon is president of the United States today because of what had happened in Grant Park that night. This was so unprecedented. I mean, you had Abe Ribicoff, the senator from Connecticut, screaming at Mayor Daley and pointing to him on national television. And with George McGovern as president of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo's tactics in the streets of Chicago. How hard it is, how hard it is to accept the truth. Mayor Daley really did have goons in that convention hall. And any delegate who got out of line or started indicating uh, that uh, he or she was going to dissent, uh, generally speaking, was either shown the door or was um, beaten up. Take your hands off of me. Dan Rather, Unless you intend to arrest me, don't, t don't push me, please. Sir, I'm what is I know you will, but don't push me. Take your hands off of me unless you plan to arrest me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, Walter, as you can see, I'm sorry to be out of breath, but somebody belted me in his stomach doing that. What happened is a Georgia delegate, at least he had a Georgia delegate sign on, was uh, being hauled out of the hall. We tried to uh, talk to him to see why, who he was, and what the situation was. And at that instant, the security people, uh, well, as you can see, put me on the deck. Uh, I didn't do very well. I think we've got a bunch of thugs here, Dan. As a family, we had a box right next to the podium, and down in the bottom of that box was a television. Mr. Chairman. Here we were looking up 
listening to my father give his acceptance speech, an eloquent acceptance speech. I proudly accept the nomination of our party. And right down at our feet was a riot going on. I mean, it was like night and day. It was two worlds. We do not want a police state, but we need a state of law and order. And neither mob violence nor police brutality have any place in America. You can't have that not impact you. You know that what is being said is what you hope people will hear. But what they're hearing and what they're seeing is what's going on outside. I think only a person with my father's deep wealth of optimism could say, OK, we're still going to do this, and we are going to win. The day he walked out of that uh, convention, he was 20 points down. He was a dead political duck in the water. The three vice presidential nominees couldn't have been more different. The one who was clearly most highly regarded from the start was Edmund Muskie, senator from Maine. He had a pleasant, reassuring manner on television, and that's exactly what people needed, and certainly Democrats needed, kind of a human Pepto-Bismol. And Humphrey realized it immediately. Muskie was actually the most popular of all of the national candidates that year in public opinion polling. The Republican Party had an embarrassment of riches for the vice presidency, and there were more than 20 pretty stellar individuals on the list that Nixon considered, from Nelson Rockefeller to Ronald Reagan. The various factions in the Republican Party eliminated this one and that one as unacceptable, and what remained were complete unknowns, including a new governor of Maryland by the name of Spiro T. Agnew. Agnew was not very adept politically because of a lack of experience. And it wasn't very long before people got to know Ted Agnew. He was a big negative for the Nixon campaign. A running mate who has a strange habit of calling people Japs and Polacks. A vice presidential nominee who has casually remarked, and I quote, if you've seen one slum, you've seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> General Curtis LeMay also turned out to be a big negative for George Wallace. My father prepared to introduce General LeMay in Philadelphia to the national press for two weeks leading up to that. He told General LeMay that I'm about to introduce you to the national, as my father put it, media wolves. And he said, they will try to maneuver you into a conversation about the use of nuclear weapons in Vietnam. The nuances of politics and the back and forth with the press was new to him. So he snapped. Doesn't make much difference to me if I have to go to war and get killed in the jungle of Vietnam with a rusty knife or get killed with a nuclear weapon. As a matter of fact, if I had the choice, I'd lean towards a nuclear weapon. I never remember the national press extolling his virtues in helping win World War II. They simply set out to try to catch him, get him, if you will, and they did that. In 1968, with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act having been long passed and the open housing law passed after Martin Luther King's assassination, Wallace was able to capitalize on the unrest in the central cities all across America. Why are more and more millions of Americans turning to Governor Wallace? Follow as your children are bussed across town. As president, I shall, within the law, turn back the absolute control of the public school systems to the people of the respective states. Why are more and more millions of Americans turning to Governor Wallace? Take a walk in your street or park tonight. As president, I shall help make it possible for you and your families to walk the streets of our cities in safety. I got to listen to my father's fiery speeches, which were just wonderful. 
We traveled from Rhode Island to uh, Florida. They hated George Wallace up north, so you would have a section of Wallace lovers and a section of Wallace haters, and he could bait the haters like nobody could. Would well, you come down when I get through and I'll autograph your sandals for you? Yes, down at the Selma Bridge. Come on back down there and we'll let you jump off of it next time you get down there. How about that? And you know the biggest bigots in the world? They are the folks that call other folks bigots. You remember that? I said in California that if I come to that state or go to New York or come to Seattle and a group of anarchists lie down in front of my automobile as president, I'm going to wean them of lying in front of automobiles. My father would go into a local area. He'd spoke, speak to a couple of civic clubs. He would do every talk radio program there was to do back in that day. He wouldn't just focus on national media. So people heard about him all the time. They listened to his message, and it resonated with a lot of people. It really doesn't matter, look. You the same like you for Wallace. You were for Wallace. His father, you were the same. 1968, uh, the Madison Square Garden rally. It was packed, and they had thousands of people on the outside listening on loudspeakers. And it was middle class people, working people, who he talked to. He talked about the beautician and the barber and the steel worker and the textile worker. He refined it down to the point where the average person thought, he's talking about me. He's articulating my frustrations and my concerns about our country. And at one point in that campaign, he was at 24% in the polls. Nixon's problem was mainly Wallace, but secondarily, it was himself. Your daughter here? Yeah, hope you got her in it. I hope so. He never really won the trust of the American public. Well, great, aren't you having fun? <laughs> the polls showed him well ahead, and that makes you cautious. You don't say much, you don't do much, you don't rock the boat. You just try and ride it out to election day. How do you expect to gain the respect of the American people in the event you're elected? Well, I think by my record of public service, when a man says that he thinks that the most important thing is to double the rate of convictions, but he doesn't believe, and then he condemns uh, the vice president myself for wanting to double the war on poverty, I think that man has uh, uh, lost his sense of values. You're not going to make this a better America just because you build more jails. What this country needs are more decent neighborhoods, more educated people better homes. I do not believe that repression alone builds a better society. Now, if Mr. Nixon can close his eyes to that, then he doesn't have enough vision to be president of this country. And that's why I've said what I've said. Wallace took some of the southern states that Nixon would have won because of his southern strategy. Nixon and his party decided that they would be conservative on race issues they would do what Lyndon Johnson had predicted. He predicted that the Democratic Party would lose the South because of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act of 64, and that the Southern strategy would turn the South, and it did. It is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. Their big hang up was Lyndon Johnson and the war. Was Humphrey able to resist Lyndon Johnson? It came to a point in time where his own staff and he recognized that if he was to have any chance at all of being the next president of the United States, he had to speak forthrightly out about how he felt about the war. My fellow Americans, I have pledged that my first priority as president shall be to end the war and obtain an honorable peace. As president, I would stop the bombing of the North as an acceptable risk for peace. 
because I believe it could lead to success in the negotiations and thereby shorten the war. Once he made that speech in Salt Lake City, it was like taking a yoke off of him. And all those people who had been cursing him for his role in Vietnam and for being basically a poodle of Lyndon Johnson and the chief cheerleader of Johnson's war, basically said in effect, if you mean it, we're with you. But you could feel Humphrey gaining momentum and us basically being static all through October. We didn't rise an inch. But I'll tell you, it isn't going to be like 48. Lots of things have changed. You remember, that was the year that Harry Truman won by giving him hell. Well, it won't work this time. Because just remember, I'm sure you will all agree with this, that it's one thing to give him hell, but it's something else to give him Humphrey, believe me. Uh, we have found that our friend, uh, the uh, Republican uh, nominee, our California friend, has been playing uh, on the outskirts with our enemies and our friends both. He's been doing it through rather subterranean sources here. And uh, he has been saying uh, to the Allies that you're going to get sold out. Mrs. Chenault is contacting uh, their ambassador. Now, this is not guesswork. And she is uh, warning them uh, to uh, not get pulled in on this Johnson move. We now know that Richard Nixon had asked Anna Chenault, who was the uh, chairman of the Republican Women for Nixon, to be a back channel to the South Vietnamese, to encourage them not to participate in peace talks in Paris uh, under the Lyndon Johnson administration, because they would get a better deal with the Richard Nixon administration. If, in fact, Richard Nixon played a hand in curtailing the peace talks in Paris, there's no doubt that that's a violation of the Logan Act, and the Logan Act essentially prevents American citizens from getting in the way of American foreign policy. It is essentially treason. Now, Nixon, even though he was a former vice president, was a private citizen at that time, so he would have been covered by the Logan Act. LBJ was furious. They're contacting a foreign power in the middle of a war. That's a mistake. And it's a damn bad mistake. When he heard what Nixon's people, at least, were doing and what Mrs. Chenault was doing. He was deeply angry. He wanted to expose Nixon, but realized that if he did so, it would be obvious that he knew because of illegal wiretaps. You just see that your people don't tell the South Vietnamese that they're going to get any better deal out of the United States government than, than a conference. Yeah, I, and also, uh, we've got to make sure that Hanoi knows they're not going to get it. Yeah, that's exactly right, and I'm, I'm doing that. But he gives that information to Hubert Humphrey. And Johnson says, do what you want with it, Hubert. Hubert. Hello, Mr. President. Glad to hear you, my friend. I'm Nixon's folks. I don't know whether he had anything to do with it or not. Don't charge that he does. I can't prove it. But some of the people supporting him had told South Vietnamese that uh, they don't let Johnson sell them out here at the conference table and bring them in the NLF. That Humphrey's going to get beat, and they'll have a bright future. And Humphrey decides not to do anything with it. He thinks the, the country has been torn apart enough. After all this time, I'm really not sure whether there was a direct violation of the Logan Act and whether you could actually call, as even Everett Dirksen, the Republican leader in the Senate, did, uh, Nixon a traitor. I, I, you know, if you're inclined that way, you will call Nixon a traitor. If you're a Republican who wanted to win in an age of dirty tricks on all sides, you'd say it was good politics. Take your pick. So I finally took the bull by the horn, got all the Joint Chiefs of Staff in, and they all agreed that, A, we should stop the bombing. I want to issue an order later tonight to stop it tomorrow. There's going to be a lot of people say, we did this for you. So for God's sakes, uh, we know, everybody knows, we don't play politics with human lives. I have now ordered 
that all air, naval, and artillery bombardment of North Vietnam cease. The bombing halt which occurred had a substantial effect in that it brought many Democratic votes to Humphrey. And the timing could not have been coincidental. At some point, the anti-war faction, or those Democrats, or those voters who were against the war, figured that if they were against Humphrey, they were going to get Nixon. And Nixon was no improvement on the Johnson policies. He had supported Johnson during the war. He had questioned his management of it, but he had supported him. And as a consequence, they decided, ultimately, you better vote for Humphrey. Two days from now, the American people will exercise that great sovereign power of the right of the ballot. And they'll be entering the voting booth where they will make the great decision as to whom shall lead them. Hubert Humphrey began to believe that he would win. He saw his private poll numbers rising pretty dramatically. He knew he didn't need a majority or anything close to it because of Wallace. And Nixon was uneasy enough so that he had a family conference right before the election, just with his immediate family. Nixon said, uh, look, we've done everything we can. I hope we're going to win, but we may lose, and I want you prepared for it. It's a very close election. The real danger for us was that Wallace would get enough electoral votes to deny us the 269, 270 you needed to win, and the election would be thrown into the House of Representatives. And all those Wallace states would then, because they had 100% Democratic delegations, wouldn't vote for Nixon for president in the House of Representatives. They would vote for Hubert Humphrey, even if he hadn't won the popular vote. The number 270 are needed. The struggle has rivaled the 1960 razor-edge finish when Nixon lost to John F. Kennedy. From about 2 a.m. till about 6 a.m., we thought we'd lost. At least that's what I was picking up, that Humphrey was doing too well in several states and that the numbers just weren't going to add up. It is indeed a toss-up. We've got those uh, big states that are outstanding, uh, New Jersey, Texas, Ohio, Illinois, and California. They are going to make the difference. Mayor Daley was holding out his votes <laughs> in Chicago, according to tradition. But our guys were apparently holding out votes in DuPage County. Daley would throw in some votes, and they'd be overwhelmingly Humphrey. And we'd throw in votes from the suburban areas, and they were overwhelmingly Nixon. And I think uh, Mitchell called Mike Wallace, who talked to Cronkite, and in effect, they went on television and said, Mayor Daley has got to turn in his vote. Illinois, with its 26 electoral votes, finally swung into the Republican column. And with it, Hubert Humphrey's bid for the high office on Pennsylvania Avenue. We had the election. And then he did the right thing. He said, it's over. The people have spoken. And the process goes on. That's tough for a candidate that comes that close. Just say, OK, now I'm going to support the next president, even though I don't agree with all his policies. But he's the next president. Having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this. Winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> that in our judgment, our movement has been successful. And I think that most of you probably thought a year ago that we not only wouldn't get on the 50 ballots in the country, but uh, had someone uh, asked you would uh, this ticket get 10 million votes for the presidency a year ago, I think most of you would answer in the negative. But Even with the 10 million votes he received, almost 14%, one more vote per precinct and it would have thrown it to the House. But, uh, and of course, it would have gone into the House without the miscue of General LeMay, I'm convinced of that. We, as a people, as a movement, misread the significance of a Humphrey victory. 
If, if Humphrey had won, we would have sustained all of the social justice programs and no doubt ended the war as well. He had a, a voice and a conscience and a track record. Humphrey's problem was he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He could not get freed from the stain of war. There are a lot of warnings that come from 1968. Doing everything we can to make sure that we are a country ruled by the ballot and not the bullet. I think we also learned something that we seem to relearn with great regularity, that the issue in American politics often is race, and it's the most divisive subject of all. I think the abhorrence of war and what the war in Vietnam dealt us has continued. From time to time, people say uh, since then, have we gotten over it, the abhorrence of war, the Vietnam syndrome? Is it dead? No, it isn't. The country, as it has done before, survives and can go on to prosper no matter how jarring events seem to be. The basic fundamental structure of government is laid out in such a way that most people think there's a way for them to have some sort of voice. It may not be true, <laughs> but they think it. And that's very important. We were shouting at each other all through that 1968 campaign, everybody, both sides. And I think we learned that that wasn't a good way to conduct an election or to run a country. Come on. Shoot the kill! Kill! Shoot the kill! Come on! We just ended 